Hi, I'm Jonathan Ver Duncan, also known as Stigmata. I am an artist, public speaker, and educator working primarily in the furry fandom. You're about to watch Fursonas, Types and Stereotypes. I gave this talk in Berlin at Euroference 2017, and to date, I think it is my best talk, had the best public engagement, and some people stayed five hours after we started because it was just so exciting to be there and be part of something. If you're interested in being part of this discussion, feel free to join my Patreon at the top here. I'm also rele releasing BOK, okay, The Dark Art of Self-Therapy, down here. And for more information on where to follow me, check out the description. Thanks and enjoy the talk. So I am glad you're here. This is Personas, Types, and Stereotypes. This is my favorite talk that I'm given, or that I have given. And I would like to start by asking you all to stereotype me. Based on my physical appearance, my accent, my clothing, my posture, I would like to ask, what are some things you would guess are true about me? You're the typical white hipster dude. <laughs> you have for that? Possibly vegetarian or vegan. Come <laughs> on, uh, we'll do all the photos for you. <laughs> No, 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 I, suspect. I drink Starbucks. I suspect you eat dolphin safe tuna. And you have dolphin an apple. And I have what? And you have an Apple computer. And you drink Starbucks. Yeah. So it kind of proves the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, those are, those are very good. It hurts a little, but... <laughs> okay, you, in the back. You are a furry! A furry. <laughs> okay, that's actually a very good big picture that's, answer. It's, okay, yes, Phil. You're a recovering sex addict. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. What? American. American? Not bad. You can hear it from here. A lot of people okay. can't, and that really surprises me because I sound so damn American. And here, if I hear an American talk, I stop it and I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> yes. You're a fantasy nerd. Fantasy nerd. Not bad. And we have one more. Wanna be gangster because, because hanger shit. Uh, it's in bandana. And by the way, do you see what this has on it? It has dinosaurs on it in the, like, the different eras of civilization. No, it's not civilization. It's, um, ooh. Oh, that's embarrassing. It's very vulnerable. I don't know shit about dinosaurs and archaeology. But it's a beautiful bandana. I got it at um, the LFC. So those, these are the things that, at least in America, I thought people were going to guess about me. And <laughs> so you also got a bit of a cheat because I explained myself. I, uh, that's weed. Yeah, yeah so um, hipster thing. Um, I worked at Starbucks. I used to drink it now. If I want an espresso poured, I'll go there because that's one of two options I have in Iowa. Uh, someone else guessed some... Okay, I am vegetarian. <coughs> So yeah, sustainable food. I care about that. Oh, I hate how right you guys were. That's awful. Why is happy? Yeah. What was that? Why is happy? Yes, it is. Yeah. Why is happy not there? Because you're wearing sandals. Oh yeah, happy. <laughs> uh, these are running sandals. So that's equally hipster. Oh my gosh, I am a hipster. <laughs> And this is the first time in my life I've said it, and it took, what, like 200-something people to get me to get it. Yeah. yeah, I would have a beard if I could. So this is one of my personas, and I would like you to guess, based on what you see here, what are some things you would assume about me? You have a pixelated cock. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, that's for a different panel, so that I'm not going to confirm or deny the resolution of my penis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're a reflective person. A reflective person. Ooh, I like that way better than hipster. Uh, <laughs> yes. Like, oh, that I've, that I've seen some shit? Yeah, like <laughs> things that he does not want anyone else to see. Mmm. Yeah, like the Lil Wayne quote, you ain't shit if you ain't never been screwed up. Is, yeah, I think that's, I think that's reasonable. Yes. Edgy, you hate your dad. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because my name's Stigmata? Because when people see that I'm smiling and relatively affable, they're like, is that Stigmata, or is like this guy sitting next to you Stigmata? People always guess the person at the table who's not me is the artist. Okay, one more. We 
Yeah, um, yeah you, you didn't get to do one, so we'll pick oh. it. Uh, you like metal music. Metal music. Okay, not bad. But I, I was actually pointing at you since you hadn't talked yet. So yes. Uh, blonde glasses, you. Yes, me. Yes. Yeah, oh, uh, you're quite a spiritual person. Oh, spiritual person. Okay, those are pretty good guesses. Um, my my Keki edgelord days are relatively behind me. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm spiritual. I've technically seen some shit, but I believe that everyone has their own difficulties that they've dealt with. Uh, we already talked about the resolution of my dick being pending. And yeah, those are all actually really good guesses. And I think there's a reason that you all guess those things based on the physical appearance of the character, because there is actually a whole lot of information in every single picture of a persona that we will ever see, whether we realize this or not. Oh, I'm so excited to give you this talk. <laughs> I would love to open up the meat of this discussion by using the word imaginary so we can talk about this. Imaginary by, oh, I don't have the source of the dictionary, I'm sorry, because that's important. They all have their different politi uh, political flavors. Imaginary, having existence only in the imagination, unreal. I would like to challenge this idea today because I know for a fact that imagination is not strictly unreal. Imagination has consequences in reality because our thoughts and the things that are not right in front of us, like um, our fears, for example, those are real. Fears become real, they can control us, they can manifest themselves in certain ways, even if they didn't physically exist. God. Also, um, like the placebo effect, if you're familiar. Placebo, fake drugs, and drug tests are sometimes just as effective as the drug that's trying to be observed. And this is an example of imagination being very real. <laughs> this Why is an anime. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, the truth. Hey. Yes. so this is, um, I don't know, T Tyler, what should we name this persona? Sailor Fox. <laughs> Sailor Foxy. Sailor Foxy Blizzard Chan. Lady Blizzard. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, I love that we're in the furry fandom and we have a wealth of opportunities that most people here are not even aware of. And the best way to understand it is to compare it to other conventions and cultures that seem to celebrate similar but not quite furry things. In the anime subcultures and anime conventions, people show up to celebrate television shows that they themselves did not create. They may have original characters based on the ideas, but it's always about people going, oh, wasn't this show cool? Oh, I love this character. And it's kind of similar with fantasy. Oh, I loved Conan the Barbarian. This chainmail bikini or thong, let's be honest, was so hot. <laughs> But again, these tend to be focusing around things like games, or film, or literature. books. Literature. Yes. I, have to, I almost forgot the word for books. This is not going to be good. <laughs> but here we have the vanilla fur, the every fur. And this, I think, is the most powerful of the three kinds of um, subcultures that have these conventions all the time, because this is about you, all of you. When you come here, when you create a fursona, and when you talk about other people's fursonas, when you look at badges, when you favorite things that represent people, you are faving an individual's reflection of themselves to some extent. There is always information that we can read into about who a person is. So when you go to the furry fandom in real life or on the internet, you are celebrating individuals and not some movie that just exists somewhere much of the time. I will talk about fan art and how that's a little different from, from this, but... I just want to say, like stress, that you guys are so fucking cool right now, and you should be honored to be here, because this is a really important part of art history, whether you believe it or not. Yeah. Yay! You did it! You all did such a good job! <laughs> You may recognize this. Yes, it's Tony the Tiger. <laughs> now, you may guess that this is furry, but that's not necessarily true. Tony the Tiger himself is what I would refer to as an anthropomorphic character and not quite furry. And I think Ware Magnus, the artist that um, has a black and red Canadian dragon character who's just like a lovely soul, one of my favorite people, she defines the furry fandom or she defines furry art as anything that comes specifically from the furry fandom. So Tony the Tiger in a commercial is not at all furry. 
Tony making a reference to furry art, say on his Twitter account, that's also not furry. Porn of Tony the Tiger is absolutely furry, unless it came from Kellogg's. <laughs> In which case, that's anthro. So I hope we all have that understanding. And you could, you know, it's, I like that furry is kind of organic and we can do what we want with it, but it also helps to be on the same page. So let's just consider furry means that it's from the community somehow. And that's because it's about you. And that's because you yourself are not a product, you are not a commodity. You cannot just hawk yourself out most of the time. And if you do, that's, you know, understandable. I'm not here to judge. But again, I love how intimate it is. I love that it's not just a representation of uh, media. Let's look at the definition for character, American Heritage Dictionary. Character, the combination of mental characteristics and behavior that distinguishes a person or a group. So we have two kinds of character here. We have a character that can be a physical character of a person or a character like the, the whole personality, how the person feels instead of just the thing standing right here. I think that there are three different kinds of personas. I think it's, they're, these aren't mutually exclusive terms, but I tend to find ideals all the time in the fandom. An example of an ideal is someone that looks not very much like their character in real life. It tends to be too exaggerated and not always something that they can attain necessarily. But it's about uh, wish fulfillment and things that they really enjoy. We have paradigms, which are a step further. They're abstract ideas. So you'll see a paradigm if you see a vent art that's drippy and bloody and sad because it's just an expression of fear and anger and frustration. Or a macro character, which I'll talk about more in detail, can be a paradigm for dominance or for exhibitionism or for confidence, even though there's no way, I assume, that you can be as big as a planet or a city, <laughs> at least in the foreseeable future, but you know, I'm not one to limit technology. The Avatar has very minimal differences, maybe some exaggeration, but ultimately... <laughs> <laughs> they're only tight. They're only Whoa, tight in some place. <laughs> yes, we, we have an OO. Um, they tend to be a one to one. They tend to be a one to one for you as an individual. The only difference is, I think the purest, um, the purest avatar would basically be you in real life, maybe with body paint, I guess. So then you can say, oh, I guess this is furry now. But it's otherwise exactly you. Now again, these are not mutually exclusive terms. You can have these in any combination. And if I hated you, I would walk you through every persona I had, but I don't. I just wanna say that there are ideals, paradigms, and avatars that can have a bunch of different combinations and overlap. And while I never did um, do all three together, although that would be really special, like a paradigm up here, that's like the ego, super ego, and id in Freudian psychology. That's an example of something that's not at all an avatar or an ideal, just an idea. Next here. Ooh, what is a stereotype? <laughs> yes, here's where you hate me and leave. A stereotype, American Heritage Dictionary, again. A conventional, formulaic, and oversimplified conception, opinion, or image. Or one that is regarded as embodying or conforming to a set image or type. So the funny thing about stereotypes is that whether they are true or not in certain cases, like you guys guessed some pretty true things about me based on physical appearance and other traits. Yeah, whether they're true or not, it always comes from somewhere. In some cases, this is a result of a statistical likelihood, but at the end of the day, all stereotypes are indicative of incomplete data or conjecture. We are always, as individuals, going to have an incomplete data set when we are trying to judge other people and other designs. As I go through different stereotypes, keep in mind that I've, I've only been in the fandom for, as an artist, about 11 years or so. I've only taken commissions since 2007. 2008, if you count when I was actually commissioned for the first time. <laughs> so, yeah, take anything I say with a grain of salt. Oh, is that... Okay. That's what I meant to do. Yeah, this is separating this into two, um, into two sections. So the yellow is, like I said, statistical or 
people that are observing something and the pink one, the second definition is the person, like if someone is a stereotype. Stereotypes can be good and they've served us well throughout our history of evolving as humankind. Stereotyping is, and this is a weakness in the English language, in the English language, we don't have a good um, transition between stereotyping and judgment and discernment. But a really important part of being a human being throughout history is being able to look at someone from a distance and decide based on how they carry themselves, oh, is this person a friend or foe? Are they going to attack me? Are they from my village? Are they a vegetarian? Are they a hipster? You know, the essential. <laughs> And that does come from stereotyping pretty much, even if it's not like, hey, that fox is a slut. You know, it's not necessarily in that direction, but it still counts as a kind of stereotyping. I want to give one of my favorite examples of stereotypes and species to help us understand this. I was at Furpocalypse, and I myself have a hair character. He wasn't a bunny. He was a hair. And I was talking to one of my favorite bunnies, Candy Cotton the Rainbow Bunny. Uh, he asks me, what is the difference? And I say, I'm glad you asked. Let's look at this water bottle. This is an algae, but we'll pretend it's a bottle. A bunny will see anything longer than wide and go, oh no, how will that fit? A hare will say, that is a water bottle. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> now, hares and bunnies, they have a very complex set of differences, and it's not observable necessarily in in character designs all the time, but it's really the kinds of people that choose them. First off, bunnies have no clue there's a difference. If you are a bunny in this room right now, I'd be very surprised if you knew that it matters if you're a hare or not. All hares know there's a difference. <laughs> bunnies are more likely to dress up like Sailor Moon and do a thing, and hares are more likely to go on an adventure and try and conquer and have a discovery. Hares are also secretly bunnies, but they don't want you to know that. <laughs> but at least it's a secret. There are some perks, despite the flaws in the model of trying the stereotype based on certain things, there are certain perks, and based on how you do it, it can really help you um, come closer to your community if you know certain stereotypes and how they work. In this case, we have an individual looking at censored um, erotic art versus pornography. This is in reference to a previous talk I gave called uh, of sexual art and pornography. So I recommend that, it unpacks a little more. Uh, if you don't know the stereotypes, if you're doing, if you're, or rather if you know the stereotypes and how things work, you can actually use the kind of artwork you're willing to display to say something about yourself and to put yourself out there. And I'm going to give a very direct borderline TMI example if that exists for me. Um, after my divorce and having a lot more freedom in who I am as an individual, I was, I was in this really weird period. Oh, actually during my open marriage that I wasn't ready for because of my sex addiction. You guys have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I was starting to do art of that character that was a hair that was nude because even though I was a sex addict, I didn't want to necessarily create porn that other people would abuse since I have that problem. But I knew I wanted to do art that was sexually confident because I wanted to be sexually confident. I was married to someone who didn't find me sexy. And I knew that if you create certain kinds of pornography and publish it, it can lead to very negative relationships. I have a friend who started doing erotically charged porn that involved her fursona, and it, it complicated her life to the nth degree. And she actually, not only because she was female, but because of the nature of her fursona being pornographized, she received a lot of threats and unwanted interactions. So you, you have to know what to expect if you are an artist that's going to promote porn, especially a character that you identify with. In this case, it seems to be working out. Both people are ugooing at each other. Industry. There are also perks to making money and to knowing what sells. So I hope you understand this is a bad dragon reference with the gray can, but if not, that's okay. <laughs> you haven't been in the fandom very long then. <laughs> Certain traits, certain species, or certain species tend to celebrate certain traits. I'll be talking about kangaroos as well, but like for an example, if someone is a kangaroo, it might not be because they love the noble quality of a kangaroo's intelligence, because they're stupid animals. It's probably because they really like thighs and feet. Or maybe they like um, balls being on the top instead of the bottom. But 
if you are a foot person and you do a king, like if you want to emphasize kangaroos, it means you might find a sweet spot in the furry market that people are very much engaging with. And I swear to you, this is a joke. I call it um, BOTF, bottom of the foot or botfa. You add this to your furry art, it's going to sell. I don't care if you break the ankle. Trust me. <laughs> Furries love that stuff. You don't have to break ankles if you don't want to, and I'm not going to, you know, you do what you want. I, I tend to focus on being really honest about my aims, and if I do work that's sexual and it gains comments that I don't like, then I tend to tell people directly. I don't block people much of the time. I've only blocked about four or five people. I tend to tell someone explicitly, thank you, I'm actually really proud of that. That's a very low blocking number. <laughs> Um, I tend to engage people specifically with how I feel about things, and I also bring stereotypes into those interactions to guess what a person's tolerance is based on how their character may look. We'll talk about that more soon. Stereotyping is sometimes not useful. As I said, stereotyping is incomplete, and I thought that most bunnies and I would not get along much of the time until Candy Cotton and I hit it off. Uh... I told him when he was leaning next to me after a while, as you can see, doing a very bunny thing in our interaction, your New York accent makes everything better. What do you mean? He says. Hey, Candy, we got to get lunch. Come on. Oh, shit, my tits. Zip. <laughs> this guy, even though he was dressed like a bunny girl and he had a skirt and he just wanted to be cute and fun. Normally, that's not what I'm into because it's a level of fantasy that keeps me from talking to the person under the suit, and I'm more interested in that. And again, I'm not shaming people who like that level of role-playing, but I'd rather just talk to the individual. This guy still used his, his native New York accent. He was still very honest and direct, and when I told him, when he asked for my telegram, that I'm not going to do small talk, I'm going to talk about how sad my life is and divorce and how I look at porn too much, then he just like gave me a fist bump and said that he wants to hang out with me because he likes the same thing. Not divorce, he likes being real. <laughs> <laughs> New Yorker stereotype, they love bragging about how shitty their lives are, but at least they're really upfront about things. And even though he was a bunny, like that's, that's the kind of person I want to hang out with. I want to hang out with the real people. Especially if you are a species that's way unusual in your behavior. Like, if you have that level of realness, that's cool as heck, and I think we need more bunnies that are like that. Ah, uh, community. Here we see it, um, my crow character Stigmata, who's not enjoying the advances of this, maybe a donkey? I don't know, it's not a very good drawing. Yeah, sometimes, uh, this gets... Stereotyping can get you in some really negative places, and this has never been more relevant than in America today, where I don't know if you've been following, but there have been a lot of hate marches and torches and a lot of uh, anti-Semitism, racist stuff, like... I mean, it's, it's normal for America, but it's, like, scarily prevalent now. And based on certain aesthetics and tastes that you have of your characters, you may attract this kind of attention when you're not all that interested in this kind of thing. <laughs> it's good to observe these communities and try and look for patterns and say, oh, this might actually be a thing I can expect. I still recommend you view people as individuals, but be aware of things like this happening. There are certain... I know, I know, I know. There are certain qualities in certain species and like certain tastes that I won't go into specifically here, but I may identify with things that you may not value or find morally justifiable as an individual. For example, if you go into a favorite gallery and you see art that looks like it's traced photographs of people having sex with animals, if you yourself don't condone this but you see it in the faves and then someone adamantly asks you to draw art of this, if you don't support this kind of topic, and this may be an issue, you can ask the client, it sounds crazy, you can ask them, is this what you're interested in because I'm uncomfortable, but I also want to you know, take the job if you know, I can trust you with this? Because especially if my, sis my history is a sex addict, I don't want to do something unless I can support someone in a healthy way. So if you see a pattern that exhibits something that you may not appreciate, you can always ask a client, is this what's going on here or am I judging? Because if not, cool, it's fine. If worse comes to worse, you misunderstood, and you can just, you know, respectfully take the job or decline. It's cool. If you know the stereotype game, if you know how to play it, and you find yourself pigeonholed, you can be in a tough spot emotionally. 
The flip side of this is that you start identifying with what people like. You start doing what's popular. You don't really do anything for yourself. And then people know you as the guy that drew the broken ankles that are still really hot feet, but the ankles are broken. <laughs> so if you don't want to do broken ankles on your bot fuzz, but that's who you are, the broken ankle guy, you did that to yourself, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's, that's now a stereotype placed on you that you have to overcome. There are certain stereotypes for the gender binary, and I mentioned gender binary and not, like I'll talk about non-binary soon, but this is something that I, I keep noticing time and time again. I don't know if you folks have interacted with bears in the fandom, but there's a big difference between male bears and female bears. If you see a male bear, they normally end up being individuals who either really, in, well, first I'll say, like they tend to be involved in the gay scene, like in the kink scenes, they tend to be bears in real life in their build, they're even likely to have bear tattoos because of the gay bear community. Like, haha, people always said I'm a bear, and what's all this hot porn I found? This is great. Now, female bears tend to be, well, first off, they're incredibly rare. Like, the, I think I've met maybe three female bears in my life, but they tend to be interested in folklore and nature and, like, the mythical qualities of, of flora and fauna. Like, they're so invested in that, and it's not likely they'll be wearing fishnet vests and um, leather daddy caps. <laughs> but if they do, that's pretty cool. Oh, lions. So, male lions, they, they have a, it doesn't really say a whole lot about a person beyond liking the aesthetics of it and wanting to be, you know, strong and confident. But they are not at all like female lions. First off, female lions, I never see them interacting with male lions, ever. Female lions don't have time for that shit. Just like the real part, like the real animal parts, they're busy. <laughs> they're busy doing things instead of sleeping, and they tend to be proactive, badass folks. Where lions that are male tend to show themselves in badass positions of power, or like, yeah, I'm doming you so hard right now. But it's, it's definitely a different flavor from the aggressive intention I see in female lions. Thank you to Lofi and Strange Fox for this gift art of horses. <laughs> so male horses tend to, they tend to really like horses. Like, they really like horses. <laughs> and they also, I mean usually, I mean usually, they also, I've never seen a horse persona with a tiny penis. <laughs> Which is weird. So. I have definitely seen horse care, like horse personas that are a way to say, by the way, my penis is above average, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Female horse characters are another rare breed, and um, I don't know if they have this in Europe, but in America they have the horse girl, which are like the kind of girls where in school they wore like brown tie-dye shirts with horses, and they, okay, they always drew like Lion King looking horses in their notebooks. Yeah. Yeah, they're... Yeah, like Lion King fandom characters, but horses. And they keep like drawing the same horse running through pastures. It's like a, oh, it's like some sort of, like some sort of nervous tick they have to get out of their system. But it's not at all talking about how big their dicks are. There's also, <laughs> I also notice a difference in how, um, and how, like, females as a gender represent themselves online versus actual females. This is gift art from Dio, the Tasmanian Devil, by the way. Very dear to my heart. Uh, so yes, these are her observations from what she's noticed. Um, these kinds of females who are G-I-R-L, or guy in real life, tend to be older. They tend to be... Um, like, they tend to be in a bimbification. They tend to be, like, older fans of furry back when it was still tangential to sci-fi and you had a lot of these offshoot things. Again, another broken ankle. <laughs> yeah, it, it tends to be something that is about fetishizing the female figure as opposed to women who, again, are like, that's, oh, that's not me. Please don't treat me like that. I feel funny. I, I can't exist in the same universe. And they're just standing off to the side uncomfortably trying to do their own thing. I added this slide, um, deer, recently, because I noticed for whatever reason that deer tend to belong to non-binary folks. 
on the gender spectrum, and particularly trans individuals. Like the, the vast majority of deer that I've interacted with were people that were also interested in the occult and mysticism, and they're like very deep, introspective individuals. And uh, one of my friends, actually, he told me that, well, this is, this is before he even used uh, male pronouns, like he was questioning these things about himself that I didn't even know about, but he did ask me um, my, my stereotype for deer, and I said, you know, this will sound weird, but it's oddly, um, like I see a lot of trans people that use them. And then I found out months later that they had actually said, hey, I'm questioning this about myself, and it's funny you mentioned that. And, like, first off, I'm really proud of them for, like, using art to develop and grow as individuals, but I was also like, cool, stereotype work. Because it's really good. If you, like, if you follow into, like, if you look at this stereotype, it means if you go to dear people, then you're likely to find people who are interesting and they're on the fringes and they're really curious folks that are interested in understanding themselves on a deeper level. So it's not a bad idea, especially if you are trans or questioning, to poke around with Art of Deer, search that on Fur Affinity, see what comes up. You might find some new friends just from trying that. Oh, now we get to go deep into species since we segue from gender and species into this. So here we see the mascot dragon. We're going to talk about dragons first because obviously they're popular. I think I see um, more European dragons than American dragons, actually, believe it or not. Uh, this is the mascot dragon. That's why I tend to call him. He's big and muscular, and, you know, he's, he's here to be sexy and cool. Doesn't really look like any animal in real life. Kind of just looks like a, I don't know, like, what's it like? Trogdor? It's, it's like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> Buff Daddy Trogdor. It's like, it's, that's definitely not like a, a lizard or something at that point. But those guys that try to be cool and sexy and intelligent and li live for thousands of years, but they sleep on a mound of treasure, but they still have muscles somehow. Those guys tend to have confidence issues. <laughs> um, the, the Asian, like the Eastern dragons and dragons that have fur on them tend to be gentler personalities that are a little more comfortable with um, self-deprecation self and humor. In general, dragons that are comfortable painting themselves as stupid tend to be individuals that are more grounded in their personalities, and they tend to be uh, gentler and quieter. So yeah, a lot of this also applies to um, how you decide to value images of your persona. If you only want art of your persona looking badass and cool and amazing, and that's it, that's likely not vulnerable and introspective art, and the deer over here like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Very big difference. Yes, wolves. Here we see the mascot wolf, the wolf dad. Here we see the gentleman wolf, who is going to swoop in with his katana and trench coat and his vape, m'lady. <laughs> <laughs> and both of these dragons are, oh, both of these wolves are... <laughs> they're kind of, they're kind of dragony, they're kind of dragony wolves. Dragon slash wolves, doesn't matter. Uh, these bo both of these dragons are 100%. Oh no! Both of these wolves. Wolves. <laughs> I deserve this. <laughs> Both of these wolves are 100% likely to get blowjobs while playing video games. It's just... <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. I'm not wrong. That's true. But then you have these wolves over here that are like the people wearing the three howling wolves and their truckers and their avatars on Fur Affinity are Google images of wolves that they found. Or the people who actually care about mythology and Native Americans and a spiritual pursuit that are like, why are you sucking a dick while playing video games? Don't like, go outside, what are you doing? <laughs> Very different wolves. But they're here and they have to deal with it. Oh, foxes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a fox that he's at the rave and he has his fishnet vest and his spiky collar. He's someone's mate, he's very furry. Um, He's an objectivist, as you can see by his taste in literature, <laughs> which means he's very smart. 
he got through his first economics class and he's a libertarian. So, <laughs> so he's smart and he's cunning and he's really sexy, but he also loves sarcasm. Ooh. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, he's perfect. This is all of my he is, he saw Zootopia and he's like, I am so Nick Wilde. That's so me. I wish they had an extra toe though. <laughs> Again, you have a different kind of fox. They like reading books, not necessarily forum posts. And they are, again, interested in literature and history and where foxes came from. They know that foxes are characters that brought intelligence and language and fire to humanity in certain cultures. And they, they came here thinking that that's the kind of thing that they could have. They showed up at a convention and went, oh my god. Just dicks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the kangaroo, uh, this, is, this is interesting. I found that there are normally two kinds of kangaroos. They're the kinds of kangaroos that like showing themselves off as dumb jocks because they wanted something that was strong and, you know, bounded and muscly. And then there's like the emerging artist in the fandom who wanted something kind of different. So, yeah, like I've, I've actually found a surprisingly polar amount of these differences where it's just either one or the other, emerging artists or like the big buffos in the gym. <laughs> Unconventional species. If you have an avian, if you have an insect, if you even have a, you know, uh, is it cetacean? I only know these words from the fur affinity categories. I don't know animals well. Yeah, if you have, if you have these sorts of unusual species, it typically means that the person actually invested time into um, the taxonomy of animals. They actually care about how the animal behaves, and they're more interested in exploring that as an idea and relating it to themselves. And some people, oh. yeah, look at those moves. Some people tend to view, or some people will gravitate towards certain species because they just like one trait and they will fetishize it. So people who are into latex and pool toys may find themselves comfortable with a dolphin persona. Or if they want to be a little less sleek and if they want to be um, bigger, then obviously you can use a whale. I also think that whales are pretty hot because they're black and white, and I love that stuff. Whales come commissioning. Oh, huskies, yes. So we didn't talk about dogs, but uh, typically canines belong to people who, they had dogs in real life, dogs are fun, they want to be fun, that's great. Dogs actually do not have, um, they don't have a large amount of diversity in their character unless they're really unusual breeds. So huskies in particular really like having fun. I have never seen a husky that was interested in, I don't know, documenting their own suffering. Or <laughs> like if, if you ever show me a husky that's like, hey, I'm just working through some shit right now and I want to talk about it and explore it with artwork, that's cool, I'd love to see it. I just haven't seen that yet. Because huskies tend to be about enjoying themselves. Now, when you add rainbows, they really enjoy themselves, and they're really gay. <laughs> and we can laugh at rainbows on characters, but the funny thing about this is that they always come from somewhere. You may be able to laugh at sparkle dogs and at rainbow huskies, but the sad truth of it is sometimes rainbows are on a persona because someone is gay and they don't know how to say it to their family, or the internet's the only place they can express it. And they do have an element of pride in themselves, and they're just trying to live that out. So, yeah, this is really hilarious, and it's not all that self-aware most of the time. But a, a rainbow husky, it exists to be fun, and it's about someone trying to do something cool. So if you ever make fun of a persona that is just any design at all, sometimes that's the coolest thing a person can think of, and you're treading on their dreams. And I don't recommend treading on dreams unless the person is your friend and you know they're already cool with that, or maybe that's their fetish. <laughs> dream, stomping. <laughs> dream stomping. That's very abstract. Very abstract. That's, that's a okay. paradigm, huh? <laughs> 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 oh, no. oh it, you're, it's going to get way worse. It's going to get way worse than this. You better get ready. So, uh, fan characters. Fan characters, whether they belong to video games or existing intellectual properties, 
they tend to be about people that enjoy plugging themselves into communities where there's already a framework together. If you guys are familiar with Dadaism, this is like ready-made art. This is like the fountain um, that is like a urinal tilted on its side to be fine art. The Duchamp of personas. Yeah, Duchamp. the Duchamp of personas. And I'm not saying this just so I could say this is like a urinal. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that you have this existing universe where you plug yourself into, and it frees you from having to do a lot of exploration deep inside here. You get to enact that outside of yourself as a person. Again, this is not something that I can just sit here and make fun of, because the idea of fan art it can exist and it can save lives. It can plug you into uh, friends and an online family that you never even had before. There are ways that you can explore parts of yourself through role playing as a Lion King character that you never would have been able to do in person in your, you know, in your elementary schools or in conversations with your parents. So this serves a lot of purpose and for some people in the room, it's a really important part of your uh, development as an individual. Uh, but it's really funny. It's still, it's still really funny at the same time. If we're able to laugh at ourselves, it's not a problem, but again, be careful about the dreams you tread on. <laughs> like, yeah, this looks really familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Toga P, if you're watching this, this one's for free. So, I accept tips. PayPal.me slash Jonathan Bear. Um, so, we can take characters that are in um, existing intele intellectual properties, and sometimes instead of personal development, it's about fetishizing a, a character trait. Like, Fox and Falco, they're both confident individuals typically, but Fox is a little different. He's not as... Uh, He's not as foolish and bravado as Falco is. He has the whole, my dad's dead and what's that mean for me thing. And there's also the idea of Falco who wants to be cool and wants to be accepted, but is also not the best. I will save commentary for later because okay, yeah, I, I, I lose my train of thought sadly. But um, yeah, this, this idea, it's not about celebrating the, yeah, it's not celebrating you plugging into a scheme. It's just about jacking off to something hot. That's acceptable, that's understandable, and it does have a place. And then there's also um, macro characters. This is, a, this is a newer thing for me that's really, really interesting. Well, all things are interesting to me, it's a problem I have. But, so here we have the observable universe, and then we have my dragon persona. He's very big and strong. So macro is a really interesting is a really interesting dynamic that we observe with characters because it can exist for many different reasons uh, based on you know whether it's hard or soft macro, whether real destruction and killing is happening, or if it's just a fantasy where someone's shy or they're trying to help a city by moving construction to you know help things or demolishing something safely. Um, it can also be it can also be this idea of exhibitionism. If you have any sexual act, say as a Star Fox character in a cityscape, everyone's going to see you. There's no way to escape it. So there's a kind of release there that exists for you if you have some sort of pressure or fear. Or you could just like really be into some sort of destruction that's fantastical and you love the idea of it being like a kaiju monster where you get to run free and you're wild and you're like a werewolf without inhibitions and no missile can destroy you. So you just get unbridled freedom in a fantastical space to get all that energy out. And this really strong thing, this really hyper paradigm, cool thing, reminds me of the Mary Sue dynamic we see all the time in personas. Or if it's a male, it's a Gary Stu. And I, I run into this so often, and I know you all do too. Some of you have Gary Stu's. I did once. Uh, they tend to be very cool dudes. Designer underwear may or may not be present. <laughs> and they are very smart, by the way. They are the smartest at, you know, the smartest in their class. They're also rich because they're very successful. Oh, they may have a very dangerous job, but they have a sense of humor about it. It doesn't mean that they don't know how to have a good time, even if they kill people for a living. 
they're also the best at what they do. Because what good is a story about an assassin if they're really bad at being an assassin? Which I would actually love to read that. <laughs> I don't know about you with that. I would love to see an assassin who's bad at their job. I prefer short stories. <laughs> Funnily enough, these kinds of things tend to be escape fantasies, and they tend to be because the person behind them does not have the most exciting life. They don't have the money. They don't have the confidence. They're not the lovable asshole that they wish they could be in person. So they have this sort of thing to celebrate those things that they enjoy and maybe enter into that space for some time as a form of wish fulfillment. But if you look deep inside of that really cool character, all you find is sadness. <laughs> Yeah, sadness. I would rather honestly see a story that's about this dude who's cool, who has, like he has, he's an alcoholic, he has kids that he's neglecting. I'd rather see a story about someone who thought they had something who is actually missing out on the big picture about what's most important to him. This to me has infinitely more value than someone being badass or than someone that's just there for me to masturbate to it. And again, Masturbating to sexy images is really stimulating, and I'm a fan of it sometimes, but come on. Yeah, again, sad. So let's go back to this ideal paradigm avatar thing and see if we can kind of flex it into a more personal case using uh, my own experiences this time. So a year ago, I was at Eurofriends. I got to meet you all, decided this was the best convention of my life, and I loved Europe, and I wanted to be back. And by diving really deep into these concepts and by giving talks like this, it only propelled my life further, and I found myself in a relationship that was so unlike my marriage to a woman previously. I was with two people that, you know, love me very much. We all actually find each other attractive, and I, you know, I'm with a black horse who's very morose, and he's very dark. And he's, well, the first time I met him actually in person, like the first time we really talked and he wanted to commission me, I said, okay, like what's the deal with your horse character? Because I get he's like a god of death and he's really strong, but what's up with that? And he said, oh, it's just about how sad and broken I am. And I said, well, I already knew that. I didn't think you would have the guts to tell me. And he said, well, I saw your talk, so I figured, you know, screw it, I'd be honest with you. And like instantly we hit it off. It helped that his character and his tastes are super nice. But he was also uh, with another person, a blue panther, and they're like a really energetic, happy, delightful person that's not at all like a black horse. But it was, I don't know, like I understood these people both, and they, their characters are just so true to who they are as individuals, and it really hit me. Like, anytime we're together and we just get to enjoy each other's space and just, like, watch a movie or, you know, the newest Rick and Morty and just, like, exist, it feels, like, I feel so at peace and I feel so thankful. And it's really easy to picture these characters together. And I just feel so thankful I'm part of the fandom in a place where I had this sort of dynamic introduced to me. But, like, these characters allow me to celebrate them on a whole new level and it's just so fulfilling for me to experience that. I would love that for other people, whether you're in a relationship or not. Thank you. I didn't like that you were clapping, so I, so I showed you some more fan art. I tried to contact Sonic Fan AG on DeviantArt, but she wasn't available due to some high school drama in 2009. She hasn't been active since. Anyway, this is, this is Jonathan the Hedgehog, brother of Andrea, and I put him here because it's reference to my talk, Try Harder, which was the first talk I gave at Eurofriends, and you can find that online for free. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is basically an idea that just says human beings need things like food and water and safety before they can talk about what religion they are and what their beliefs are. You have to play by caveman rules before you can stop, start talking about the highest level of civilization. A lot of people, um, they tend to have characters that already have their moral models and their creativity and their lack of prejudice and acceptance of facts. Def definitely lack of prejudice in the furry fandom, right? Like, there are a lot of people that are up here, maybe they even went lower with um, esteem, but way down here, breathing and food and water, I don't see that as often. I can't imagine a lot of sexy dragons or wolves needing a drink of water. We normally don't see that. 
And that's such a shame because I look at um, Jonathan the Hedgehog, brother of Andrea, and I see that surely he cares about the safety of his family if he has Andrea as a sister. I wonder, like, along with her, does he, does he need a drink of water? Do, like, does, does he have somewhere to sleep? Is he safe? Or is he just running around in the world because in video games you don't always need to go to the bathroom or drink water or sleep? Well, sleeping's coming. You have to get your HP back. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Again, with a try harder thing, I have this model where I believe the entire experience of a commission is art, not just the picture, but the whole conversation that you have with people. So from a client, you're bringing your own experiences, the artist is bringing their own experiences, but for the best commission, you go outside of yourselves and you get to have this journey and you get to talk about it and the art happens right here. That's such a cool thing. And you can apply this if you know what to expect from someone like a Husky. If you have a Husky that wants to commission you and you already like Husky designs, which I definitely like, they normally have... Um, reliable patterns that are already aggressive and cool and exciting, and they tend to follow a relatively natural form. You can take the basic husky and you can challenge them outside of themselves to go a little bit further than just having fun, but seeing how far down on this pyramid do you want to go. If not, it's cool, but you know, if you have that need, it's, it's a thing you can consider that's definitely worth their time and it will probably, if they decide to go with it and humor you, it'll probably be a really great experience for you both. You can take this husky and you can bring them down. You can have them wonder about um, food and water. You can even use this if you have the time and if you have the emotional means to make sure that the character represents what the person needs in real life. Because a lot of furry art is about people having fun and being cool and being exciting, but it's not about what you need right now. So when I take commissions, if it's just a sketch, yeah, I'm all about making something cool and sexy by all means. I love that stuff. But if you commission me for something more, if we get to go have a discussion, really breathe in deep, then I really want to know, are you meeting your needs? Can I give you something you need? If I do something cool for you, how can I make it not just cool, but how can I make you love yourself more? How can I make you love your fursona more? How can I give you a fursona that makes you love your life partners more? These are things you can totally do with your furry art commissions, but you have to know first that it's an option and that there are all these different factors to explore. Here is the slide where we need to lock the doors. We're going to talk about baby bears. <laughs> and I promise this is worth your time. This is actually my, oh, I'm so excited to give it. So obviously by the reaction and the, oh God, Jonathan, please don't. We already have our opinions about this part, like this subculture of our subculture. But because I'm Jonathan, and again, I have a problem by being curious about everything relentlessly. I actually asked baby furs, especially who came to my table and loved my art, I'd ask them, oh, this is, my art's not like your badge, so uh, why are you a baby fur exactly? And by asking, I'd say around 15 baby furs probably in my career, I got some really good answers, but almost all of them tend to express some ide idea of being taken care of. And you may not expect it based on the really immature diapers and you know, I'm in Muppet Babies. You may not expect that they're actually very committed adults who have too much responsibility in their lives, and it's time for them to have a break. Some of them are managers, and they have relentless jobs where they're so tired of taking care of everyone and having their phone ring 24-7 because they identify with their work and they wish they didn't. They just want to be able to sit in a place and have fun and deal with simpler problems like sharing a toy. There's even an individual who I spoke to a few years ago who said that they had a critical injury that rendered them incontinent, so they actually need adult diapers in real life. And by finding the baby fur community, and by finding a place where diapers were normalized, they were less ashamed of this limit their body had. They hated that they couldn't control their bowel movements, but in some context, it actually made them hate themselves less. And I saw that and went, oh no, I can't make fun of baby furs anymore because that's a really important part of who you are. So yeah, it's unusual, and this, I'm sure it has its, you know, its um, dirty secrets. I don't want to use a poop pun, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're the, they're the negative parts of being a baby for just like any other subculture, but I can't deny that this is actually a really healthy thing for some people to do, and even if you don't take a baby for commission, because I probably won't, I am endlessly thankful that baby furs actually told me where they were coming from because that is incredibly important. 
And it's so much more valuable to me to talk to a room of people and say, hey, I learned this thing. That's weird, but I'm glad I knew it. Maybe you should know too. Instead of being like, wow, that's fucking weird. And Because <laughs> honestly, I used to be into some shit that was way weirder and more dangerous than this. Like I mentioned with my history of being a sex addict. So I'm very much interested in people reaching conclusions and being honest about who they are. And all this to say, we need better stereotypes. If you see sauna chew on the internet, that's an opportunity for you to, <laughs> to take inventory of your life, but also to, consi also to consider what is, the autis uh, what is autism? What's the autism spectrum disorder? What does this mean for you as an individual? Do you, like, how can you further the discussion? I think that's the tricks rabbit with the giant butt. I don't know. But anytime you see someone who has something, even if it's a husky, where you think you have it figured out, you don't necessarily. There will never be a 100% accuracy rate for, you know, for every single species. Everything I said was incomplete data. It was just my observations. All I can do is say, we need better stereotypes, and I would be so thankful if you all in the fandom decide to take this information to... Um, make a more complete discussion, to challenge yourselves about how much you know based on species and other traits that people may have in their art. I did this in an art collection called Be OK, where I basically was really honest about the stuff that I didn't like about myself. I painted a lot of really sad pornographic images, almost all, for, all furry, strangely enough. And yeah, I put it up online. There it is if you want to buy it. If you can't afford it, just message me. I'll give it to you for free. I just want people to see that journaling and doing personal art that really means something is important, and it's a critical part of my discussion here. To wrap things up, I'd also like to say that I'm giving this talk because of my patrons. There are currently over 70 people that believed in me, and it bought me the time to structure this talk, and it was actually a critical part of me creating this character, Resin, and it's actually changed lives already. Even with BOK, okay, people are messaging me saying, wow, the direction of my life has forever been changed and I'm infinitely thankful. So these people who respond to me, they're really, they're really the best part of all this. Thank you for being part of this discussion and for interacting with me. If you want to continue having a discussion, I'm in the dealer's den tomorrow. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, also, there's a mailing list in the back with business cards. I would be honored if you join my mailing list to see when my next talks are and what conventions I'm going to because I guarantee you the people in this room are people I want to talk to. You're really interesting and, and desirable. You have something to offer others, so you know, start exploring, decide what you mean to yourself and your art and your persona, all that stuff, and share it with people. And thank you for coming. I would like you to applaud yourselves because you all are wonderful. Jonathan here. Thanks again for watching the talk. Glad to have you along. If you want more people to engage in what you experienced here, then please consider donating to my Patreon. We're in the process of getting this video professionally translated to Russian, Japanese, and other languages so even more people can experience the message. Also, there were hours of discussions that weren't included in this talk beforehand and afterwards. If you'd like access to this, feel free to join my mailing list. We are going to have a sound file that we're distributing to everybody. Thanks again for being part of this, and I hope to hear from you soon.